back from the past season three, episode nine, EP nine. It's your boys, Uncle E. We back in the flesh. We and back. Your boy Anzo, back with another classic. Yes, sir. Who says it? is that Nas? It's is a it classic. Nas? I, th- I think it's probably Nas. Nas. I think it's we'll Nas, give Nas right? the credit for that one. You know what I mean? What's going on, people? Welcome back to another episode. Yes, sir. We're back in a hidden. Undisclosed location. Come um, on, recording this fuego for you guys, and <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, it hasn't been that long since the last one. You know, what no, saying? no, um, yeah, it's been like what mm. three weeks, two, yeah. four weeks. Definitely been more diligent about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, happy to be back for another episode. Yeah, we're you closing know, out the season here. You know, out. after this, one more to go. So it's about that time for spiritual cleansing. Spiritual so. cleansing time, you know. Yeah. How's uh how's 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 everything, bro? How you been? Yeah, we've been good, you know. Um, made made a few trips. Uh, mm-hmm. again, wanted to give, went to see my brother, surprise my brother for his uh 40th birthday. Shout out, shout so, out to the one and only Malik. Yes, yeah, shout out to Malik. Happy so, 40th. Uh, I have you know September 22nd for me and my family. We have a, you know, it's a it's a day of birthdays. So my older brother Malik, uh, mm-hmm. it's his birthday. Um my niece to uh baby Aisha it's her birthday and cousin Tima as well. So it's a uh, smart bro. Yeah, so a happy birthday again to yeah. you know bro, niece and Tima. Happy know. birthday to the fam. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And then DXB and then what? Uh DXB then you know went to Charlotte then Atlanta for a cousin wedding. So mm-hmm. you know family family trips, you know. I I'm, I'm the type where I go on like that's like vacations for me is like mm-hmm. I don't know if people are like that. Like if I go say I'm going on vacation, mm-hmm. for me that's going to visit family. I don't know. Okay, I, I see what, what you're saying. Like for you? Uh it, mostly going mostly, to see family, right? yeah. but sometimes it's cool to like just get your group of friends and go of somewhere, course. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. How you been though? What's going on? What's Bro. going on on the Anzo experience? What hasn't been going on, man? I feel like I don't sleep. But nah, you know, we just been staying low working. Yeah, yeah. Went to Lost in Rhythm. <laughs> How was that? Please. Lost in Rhythm was an experience. Uh, what were the, okay, give me two two of the like give me two highlights and two low lights of the Lost in Rhythm and maybe if people do, who don't know what Lost in Rhythm was. What so happened? Lost in Rhythm, if you don't know, was a is a Afrobeats festival that mm-hmm. happened in Sacramento. Okay. Was it two weeks ago, right? Uh yes, yeah. about two weeks ago. Yeah, because I was in Portland last week, but Basically, it's a, it was just an Afrobeats festival. A bunch of different African artists came through. Uh, really, mostly Nigerian, you know. Afrobeats um, artists? Yeah. So... A couple Ghanaians. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was it was a pretty massive concert. Uh, highlights, WizKid shut it down. Really? Yeah, man. He was fire. Uh, Berna, Tiwa, Rotimi was really good. Oh, okay. Um, Thames, Amare, like... There was not one bad performance except Goldlink. Oh, okay. I think somebody said something to him that <laughs> pissed him off, so he like. Oh, he was not feeling it, huh? Bro, the energy was weak, man. I don't know. I really want to know what happened. Well, but uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I don't want to dig into that situation, but yeah, overall okay. performances were great. Good performances. Um, sound was a little. You know, on the first day it was a little off, mm. and then overall the logistics of the. Was it planned the, well? The second day was. Okay. Uh, the first day definitely had like growing pains. Okay. Uh, there was like a stampede that happened at one point. Oh, uh, yeah. The VIP stage setup was a little off. Uh, there weren't enough vendors for food and drinks. So, you know, you were standing in line for a really long time. But I commend their team because the second day was a lot better. Okay. Uh, so they stepped it up. Stepped it up really well. Okay. Um, and. People definitely had a more pleasurable viewing experience then. Uh, so shout out to the Lost and Rhythm team for that. Nice, nice. Like, yeah, that's yeah. that's good to hear. After, you know, the Afro Nation thing yeah. with, you know, people trying to get their refunds. Right. Now another one, it could quickly start building a reputation of these organizers of African fe- Afrobeat festivals. Exactly. Are, you know, come with all this pain. So it's yeah. it's good that they, you know, eventually they got it right on the second day. And I remember, I think we talked about it one time when Jadena was Jadena, talking about, yep. you know, when he was in London, he didn't get to perform. And, yep. 
And you're talking about those operational things that mm-hmm. need to happen mm-hmm. in order for us to, you know, get ahead of the rest yeah. and grow the, the brand of Afrobeats to the world. And he was spot on because the second day, great. You know, first day needs work. Okay. But uh, whoever put it together realized that and they realized the urgency because it's not like it's not like back home where you can you say you were going to be on stage at 11, <laughs> sure, but like four you know, stuff like that. So. <laughs> Uh, they definitely understand like the business of that in okay. America, and that was that was really good. That was good. Yeah, that so, was good. Then you know, lost in rhythm. Then you know, been DJing small, small here. Ah, there. small, small. Look at him. <laughs> Man's out here shutting down. <laughs> and, you know, like Skepta. You know, shut down. <laughs> shut down <thing. laughs> but yeah, bro, that's really been it. Nice, that's really nice. Been it. Yeah, what's up? Um, but. Today, we wanted to talk about, coincidentally, business in yes. Africa. Okay. You know, this is the it's, finance guy here, so... No, 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 please. Know. No, please. But it, it just la- relates to something like Lost in Rhythm, Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, business on the continent, rather, though, because it's not... Lost in Rhythm was here, but some of the fastest growing, you know, markets and... In Africa? Yeah. And, and overall, just economic sectors. Uh what do you think is some of Well, them? I mean, just to start off with, I feel like that's something that we probably all need to educate ourselves more and uh, more on and be aware of. Mm-hmm. You know, we're all focused on the markets in the U.S., stock mm-hmm. market, you know, here. And, you know, maybe because we live here and stuff, but a lot of time we fail to realize Africa as an the growth potential that mm-hmm. is out there and mm-hmm. uh, what industries are trending on what markets are booming. So, you know, it's exciting. And I feel like this is something we should talk about more. A hundred percent. I think the opportunities are endless. Um, it's definitely, it's it's a drawing board for many things, oh, right? Oh, for sure. Um, for sure. That's not to say everything is, you know, peaches and cream. There's <laughs> No, of course. <laughs> there's definitely a lot that needs to be improved upon, but um, there's, there's tremendous opportunities there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, what do you think? Give me one. So, you think I mean, about. I know we, you know, did a couple just to see, all right, where was, um, you know, Africa in terms of right now industries, you know, uh, what were maybe like top industry, you would mm-hmm. say, if you were looking into investing in Africa or you kind of have those plans and, you know, kind of like as I shared to you, you know, just looking at, you know, just Googling quick research, um, we were able to see that, um, you know, about the top five industries in Africa, I think uh, we saw one was industrialization, mm-hmm. two, agriculture, three, infrastructure, four, digital and mobile access, mm-hmm. and five, which is urbanization. Okay. Um, so these, uh, and we'll put the sources too, if anyone is interested in reading more about them, were deemed the top five uh, fastest growing industries in africa for me Mm -hmm. now going back to your question Mm -hmm. i feel like um industrialization and agriculture is just engineering me where i lean more towards Mm -hmm. in terms of knowing there's that opportunity and for agriculture let's start with industrialization um africa we are known for producing raw materials right and if i'm using gambia as an example you know let's say gambia you know exports cashew nuts okay but largely you will not find an industrialized process of mass manif- mass processing of cashew nuts, right? Mm-hmm. Largely, you know, you, you harvest it and they, they sell it raw. Mm-hmm. And then that goes, you know, to another country, you know, and they do the processing. And guess what? By the time they sell it, that supply chain, they're selling it at three times, four times, Five times the original, a, a, a bunch. Yeah. So I always notice that there's a, if you tie industrialization in terms of, uh, introducing advanced manufacturing methods and automation and automation, well. yeah. you know, and you know, high end machinery mm-hmm. into creating uh, processing facilities, um, and just you know using also data science in agriculture that U.S. is doing here. Yeah. That there's huge opportunity in Africa because. The you know the crops are there the, you know you there's so much that we export that other people from other continents take it take it process it and are making a killing so um, those two out of the top five mm. um, were ones that uh, kind of stood out for me stood out for you yeah yeah how about you um 
Well, I think for me, because of the, I guess, my background as well mm -hmm. and my family's background, uh, agriculture, number one. Okay. I was having a chat with my uncle uh, when I was back home in 2019, 2020, and he, he, he said something simple. He was like, uh, in 2080, right, the population of Africa is supposed to surpass 1 billion, I think. Are we already there? I mean, it's 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 towards that trend. Is, is Africa, Africa has population. to be the, It has to be one like, of the fastest. So we're at one point two six billion. Uh, one point two six. Yeah. The, the okay. So I forget the projection he was telling me, right? But in twenty eighty, he was giving me like a projection, right? And he was like, "How are you going to feed all those people? Because th that's something standard. You, you need to. We can feed them with currently using cutlass and you know." <laughs> And exactly using so, methods that were 200 years ago so you you take a, a small example like um a restaurant right mm -hmm. how does a restaurant or not even a restaurant let's say a farmer right how does he scale his product in order to meet his one his suppliers demands right so the suppliers that take his product and sell it um so they're the middleman sell it to the customer right um and two how does he ensure that he's making his process the most efficient, right? So what is he yep. growing? Is he growing a crop that's going to take, you know, a year to, to, to harvest? Yep. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And how is he? how effective is he being with his land, right? So I started thinking about that and I was like, you know, people need to eat. If you if you look at America, the, the some of the top 1% richest um, billionaires mm -hmm. in the country are... The biggest landowners as well. Yes, of course. And you'll go to places like the Midwest, um, you know, Ohio, Iowa, all these farming places, right? Yep. Farming uh, states. And what do you find? It's just cornfields. You see and, what I'm You know, so, big farmlands. So it's like we're a land that's the continent of Africa is a land that's abundant in. in Come on. You know, it, it's. And, and you know, no, it's completely right and yeah, so. what sticks out to me most was you mentioned there and identifying one what the potential problem or demand will be mm -hmm. is if industrialization and ag agriculture are the top two fastest growing in, in, in industries in africa exactly that means that whatever process you introduce whatever way of you know harvesting crops for example mm -hmm. it has to scale it has to scale so there's this industrialization and agriculture needs to scale Absolutely. in Africa in terms Absolutely. of output, the Absolutely, amount of output yeah. you can have. I, we were watching a documentary on an Ethiopian flower farmer, and she's managed to implement like um, a sort of automation that knows exactly how much her roses need, how much uh, water her roses need. You mm -hmm. know? Um, she's implemented things like greenhouses and yes. minimized labor as much as you minimize possible. labor and maximize automation and that's just and her results are tremendous yeah because you can you know? scale you can scale to meet demands you know absolutely um i like it yeah so those two and another important one i think too is of course uh mobile the power of um the mobile phone. like accessibility yes yeah. Yeah, yeah you know we already know i know kenya which one has the m pesa, m -Pesa yeah m -Pesa. You know, we are telecommunications and you know africa probably is a continent that uses mobile phones more than any, anyone it feels like it least, <laughs> exactly. you know? everyone has a phone or two phones so yeah it's a huge power there. that's a whole market that's a whole industry of you can create businesses of it's e-commerce you know different online platform mobile mm -hmm. banking mm -hmm. think of mobile services that can that you can cater or develop to handle africans the amount of africans that use mobile phones and you i know? think the the biggest opportunity there too is if we don't have the infrastructure to support yeah you need and to. facilitate populations being able to easily access uh, goods and services right yep how do you then mitigate that and you bring up a, a wonderful point about uh, mobile uh, accessibility, things like M-Pesa, mo uh, mobile money for MTN, yep. um, things like that mm -hmm. have almost damn near uh, negated the need for like banks, you know, um, yes. or you have someone in the village, uh, they don't have to 
travel however many kilometers to go to, to, go to access money you know go to or, a corner shop and get that money exactly you know? so, um, the money comes straight to their phone and if they need to pay by cash or something like that then now they have kiosks set up around easily town but easily. Uh, you think of like an older population they don't have accessibility like that and you know internet might not be as strong in places like that of course 100% accessibility is a very, 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 very big no. and fast-growing market. No, for sure. And, you know, to kind of what I quoted from the articles we're reading where it said that, you know, because, you know, Africa, we used to still be import heavy, right? And what uh-huh. we're talking about fastest-growing is, you know, um, that importations, things that Africa imports, you know, which is largely after it's processed and brought back. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, I remember one time my dad having, you know, going on a a whole, you know, soliloquy of why don't we have a fruit juice processing plant Mm -hmm. in Africa? We produce all these fruits and export it, but we don't have a processing plant. Mm -hmm. We we get all these fruits, we send it away, and we come back and drink Don Simon, you Mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So, I know, it was kind of funny when he was on that kind of, like, soapbox, but you think Mm -hmm. about it, he's right. So, that industrialization, you know, and, you know, when we did kind of the looking into it, it said here, for example, I'm going to quote from the article, and Anyone's interested, we'll put these links. It says, as Africa substitutes its imports and meets its growing local demand, it is estimated that African industries have the opportunity to double production to nearly one trillion within a decade. And that ties into that population growth that you're saying to. This is huge opportunity. So, very big. Potential's there. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I can't say enough about that, but the need for i guess people to even see the vision i don't know sometimes leadership plays a, a huge factor yeah, yeah. um yeah. but or and sometimes it's just straight up exposure you know uh because if they knew that mpesa is a mo- is like a used as a case study or a model for fintech mm-hmm. in places like america you yep. know now you would be seeing the sorts of opportunities that we have as a, as a whole continent. Uh, so, man, uh, can't say enough about how much we need to not only invest there, but in educate our people here and there oh, about yeah. the sort of opportunities that are around. Yeah, you know? yeah for um, sure. I'm not saying it's a bit of roses. It's definitely probably more challenging than it is pleasing, but... It's it's needed because of the 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 fruits that our kids would benefit. Of course, kids, you, know, you know. Of course, of course. Um, and just wasn't what did Ghana say about uh their cocoa? So I mean, Ghana, you know, they've been using them as an example. They've been, you know, producing and exporting cocoa. It's kind of one of the their main known exports where they kind of get their profits from. Mm-hmm. And now I think there's a rise in oil production that they do as well. Mm-hmm. And also, Ghana is providing another initiative of creating avenues for the diaspora, specifically they're targeting African Americans, okay. returning to Ghana and contributing to their economy. Okay. So sort of like a welcome back right yes okay. and that um i think that the ghana using ghana as a case so that kind of ties into i think what we wanted to talk about next is well we know these industries are growing africa still countries are you know whatever they are blessed with natural resources they export those mm-hmm. they, don't, they don't largely process it but it's exported whether it's oil which we all know oil from, you know, Nigeria, Nigeria. and, you know, now Ghana too is, you know, becoming a Drilling, big player yeah. in oil with cocoa, you know. Cobalt as well in Co- Congo. Congo, they are just the holy grail it's, of natural resources, yeah, you know. Yeah, a lot but, of minerals. Um, you know, so that is that has been the standard. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's been interesting and I think it's what caught what our attention to of, you know, we all heard about a few years ago, the whole year, the return. Mm-hmm. with ghana and kind of this uh, it's always been there but you can notice there's been a the president uh what's his Nana, Nana, Akufo, Akufo, oh, yeah, yeah yeah he he's been really pushing on you know kind of you know and the whole government of you know, luring you know african americans largely to come back you know and you know 
contribute to the economy and settle in Ghana mm-hmm. and providing avenues for them. So that's something that I feel like it's uh we should talk about in if this is a uh, is basically offering African Americans or people of the African diaspora or of African origin. Yeah. And you know, kind of kind of creating the opportunity or kind of what can I say? Like I don't wanna say they're in some way wooing or trying to lure them in but yeah. you know they're just saying, it's basically like opening the doors to say yeah. come back return and contribute to our economy uh-huh. that is a better alternative than staying in the u.s okay so ghana's been heavy on that yeah they have i mean they, everything they they've been doing from like you were talking about things like uh, uh investing in things like agriculture right uh, they've been in the entertainment sector with yes. music, right? Yeah. Uh, Afrochella yeah. is in Ghana. They've been doing the Year of the Return. Cardi B was there yep, like two they, years ago, right? Yep, yep. Uh, they've been in the tech industry. There's there's this really dope uh, coder. What's his name? Idris Sandu. He's, he hangs out with, or he's rubbing shoulders with like Jay-Z, Kanye, wow. all them, right? He's taking his own personal fund and he's going to build a a technology uh, center in a place in Ghana. I forget what the place is, right? So they're tapping into not just like singular sectors. They're spreading, right, that 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 influence, and they called it the right to right to abode, right? Yeah. So so they're taking full advantage of that and saying are. like there there's opportunities and everything, right? So. I mean, how feasible it is. This is though, because you know. So first it, thing, first thing, I think it's feasible, and the first thing that comes to mind though is people have to want to make that uh, that move, right? And they have to be enticed to the point where they're like, "This is a better life for me," right? A better alternative. A better alternative, yeah, or a better quality of life, right? Uh, what in 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 what sort of uh, way is the government effectively saying this is the only option and how do you how do you come how do you compete with the opportunities that America has to offer I mean they, they, you can because you know I think Ghana of course even from the president they realize African Americans are the richest black people in the world okay and He's saying that, or, you know, that country is saying that, hey, come back, you know, and return back to your roots. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of feeling of, you know, that not knowing your heritage, not knowing kind of, you know, you've been through the whole slavery and we can go again through the colonialism and that whole system, right, of Mm -hmm. separating a large group of black people and you know, Afro-Americans, Afro-Caribbeans away from kind of their heritage. And Ghana, you know, it, their whole independence, their whole colonialism, it's kind of built, driven around that pan-Africanism, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's tapping into that and providing the picture of, look, we have created structures and we have created a, not the economy. Um, we have created the transparency to allow you to come back to the home, in essence, to your okay. motherland and contribute to society and gain more fulfillment than if you stayed in the u.s i I do have like a lot of questions about it i think it's feasible right i think it's very feasible and if you read the facts that we saw here yeah what did it say it says ghana is i don't know if still but it was the only country to provide people of african ancestry the legal right to stay in the country indefinitely through this right to abode right to law. Abode, yeah, that's that's correct. And um, what does the right to abode law say? It's basically if you are of you know African ancestry or African origin, kind of your you know your heritage. Well, I don't know if your heritage, but I'm sure if you let's say do a DNA test and it says you're of African ancestry, yeah. it's basically built around hey African Americans or African Americans, anyone from the diaspora. Yeah, you know you are allowed to return back to Ghana mm-hmm. and, you know, eventually or even at then you'll be able to get your citizenship. I think 
the only question I have around that mm-hmm. would be the cultural impl- uh, implications of that, right? Is because naturally, if you move to a more like cosmopolitan, inclusive uh, sort of society, right? You have to sacrifice a bit of your culture, right? Because it's not like you're saying like, oh yeah, if you're of African heritage, come to Ghana. But now you have to start wearing kente. You have to speak Chi. Well, you have to wonder too, you if, know? But that's the thing is, how far are they willing to let go of To that? assimilate? Yeah. Or not not the, the people coming in, but the, the people, people receiving. The people already there. Yeah. Well, I wish we had a Ghanaian here to tell us their perspective <laughs> on how they feel about... How would you feel about if that if, was Gambia? If Gambia, a large group of, you know, a lot of African-Americans are coming in mm-hmm. and, you know, living there. I think it's a good thing if, like I said, it is a direct contribution to the economy. Mm-hmm. They're building businesses, hiring Gambians, mm-hmm. um, you know, and if, if it's in that aspect, right, mm-hmm. they are, you know, because I would, you know, it's one of those where I would rather have, I will be okay, right, rather have if in Gambia, there are, you know, lots of African Americans, let's say, return and they're opening businesses, mm-hmm. you know, shops, you know. And hiring Gambians, you know, with open schools and, you know, making sure that it's catered towards, you know, contributing directly to the country too. Because if you say you're a Ghanaian citizen or you're a Gambian, you know, citizen because you are of your ancestry Mm -hmm. and you come back, that means you have to serve your nation in an aspect of, in a way, right? Okay. And that, those are the measures I want to see. Are you contributing to the economy? So ultimately, and benefiting our the the people. Yeah, ultimately, you want that dollar to remain in Gambia. Exactly. Right? Okay. Let the you know money stay there and its benefit because what happens with our foreign businesses? You know, we can go about being taken over in Africa. Industries we yeah. take on over. Do you really think that that money stays in the country? No, absolutely it does not. not. Uh, that's happening. With it does the, not. A lot they of different people hire, coming you in. You know, they, they don't treat you as well. You know, because they're not from there. Yeah. You know, so it's not the same. Besides the operational costs, all the profits, revenues, Gone. everything goes back directly it's to out. their foreign countries. Yes, and yeah. it, their, you know, families and every people are the ones, are the benefactors. Mm-hmm. You know, the locals never benefit from it. Mm-hmm. So if if having African-Americans or anyone from the diaspora return and that's what they can contribute to, who am I to say, you know, you, your culture, you, you know, people who start you know wearing chains and stuff they already do that anyway <laughs> so uh, like america Have you, you know, I, I don't think uh we there should be cultural concerns okay i don't think so i don't think um I, like i said we can't speak for ghana because i don't know how it is in but i think largely it's probably uh going well for those because a large number of you know african americans are moving to um, to Ghana. I, and I don't think it's just Ghana too. I know that yeah, even Gambia too. Some are, you yeah. know, a lot uh, of people are relocating back home. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's there. It started before the whole year year of return movement, and I think uh, for sure Gambia they they go yeah. back. Uh, I saw and Cape Verde, Cape Verde, like a lot of West African countries. If yeah. you create frameworks. And that allow an ease in terms of entry and stay. Mm-hmm. You can uh, be very successful. It first starts with tourism, though, so because they'll first come, you know, visit tourists, mm-hmm. and then you know, envision whether or not it's a better life if they live there. You have lower cost of living, most mm-hmm. likely in mm-hmm. in Africa than in goes these countries, especially West Africa, and versus in the U.S. And which alternative mm-hmm. is your quality of life going to improve? by living you know the u.s or not so that begs the question too how much do these people or how much do these countries invest in tourism you know well what did we find what was this fact again? they said that according to the ministry of tourism the initiative generated about 1.9 billion in revenue from tourism so now it's just in ghana in ghana yeah they're whole year of the return model and you know advertising exactly. to african americans to come back mm-hmm. and you know celebrate the culture and kind of feel that, that reconnection back That's to your 1.9 billion dollars 1.9 billion yeah which is it's what does that translate to local businesses i hope hopefully hopefully, local businesses, hopefully yeah. hotels you know yeah. services yeah all I hear is economic growth. Exactly. Um, I, I think it's great. 
I think also that the Ghanaian leaders probably realize that, right? Um, and invest in that, you know? Yes, because they, they knew the potential. Not only is that painting a positive light of the country, you're also bringing in positive dollars. You know what I'm saying? You you get in, you're getting mm-hmm. direct benefits from yep, that. Yep, from the riches, you know. From we the do riches. have to hold them accountable on how they, you know, spend this money. Yeah, how they spend um, it. And like you said, mentioned too, um, no matter what though, you know, it's the whole Killmonger returning to Wakanda vibe mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. There's a lot that plays into it is if you return back to Africa as an African-American, you know, you truly have to, you know, see yourself as, you know, not as an equal to any, let's say, Ghanaian citizen. You is have it to, as an equal? Yes, mm-hmm. you have to. You can in any one mind because, you know, people have, a, I feel like privilege and a sense of Superiority has a strange way, even among, you know, black people, mm-hmm. of translating. Okay, I you hear that. You can't go back and still think you are better than, you know, than regular or people, or, you know, the locals. But I don't I, even I like think, that word, locals. I think that's just like a, a human nature thing. I know? know, I know, I know. But I'm just saying that's... Because uh, it's like when we had the two shy guys and, you know, we talked about the whole dynamic between you know, African-Americans and Africans. It's usually, you know... For especially here, for us living in America, there's been always, you know, we had talking about from true high school experiences of it's always not been the best relationship, <laughs> to say the least. I mean, th- there's there is that truth to it, but it's also can't uh, kill Manga and return and be in peace with, you know, the Wakandans. Of course, I was, I was, I was, I was hurt. When he just took the knife out, because I was like, "No, but I mean, Killmonger had an anger to a certain degree that uh, it, it was very it, relatable to a well, lot." Well, yeah, of... he, he, but they killed his dad. No, no, the no, King no. killed his dad. Yeah, but still, it's the acceptance because I'm sure um, if you know people from the diaspora or African Americans return back, they, you know, they, I'm sure they would want to feel accepted. Mm-hmm. Um, by whichever country they go to, and I don't think we can That's truly the, answer if they're gonna I be. I don't. Accepted. I don't think that. But I don't think Africans, at least in Uganda, I don't know about other places, but I don't think they're. They're not like they're very hospitable people, you know. So they're not. If you have money. <laughs> <laughs> nah, just joking. Just joking. I mean, um, you can't be a you can't be a jokester <laughs> coming through, you know. Like you no, have to, no, no. But. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like I said, I'll I'll definitely want to hear more about you know experiences of. You know, I know on YouTube, there are a couple of YouTubers who just document that, talk about moving back to yeah. Africa and their journey. And, you know, I, largely most of them advocate for, especially African-Americans, to, hey, if you are in the U.S. and you are largely struggling, you know, living that, you know, yeah. paycheck after paycheck life. Yeah. Um, this is a better quality of life you can achieve by returning to, well, yeah, yeah, it is a return, returning back to mm-hmm. Africa. It's most definitely. I think that, um, just like you said, economically, it makes better sense, mm-hmm. um, because you yep. can save up a little bit of money and go live, you know, yep. uh, with a better quality of life. Um, but also like from, from an intrinsic value standpoint, it, it has very, very large benefits. I agree. I agree. But that kind of brings us to the end of this episode. We yeah. can really talk, talk. But not only that, bro, there's so many things to talk about. We're just scraping the iceberg. Yeah, like, yeah. It's just to, you know. To ruffle the feathers, as yeah, they say. Yeah, let us know. You guys, there's a lot of potential here, you know. These conversations can go on for days. And, uh, man, I... <sighs> There's a lot to be said, anyways. Yeah. Because we just touched on a few different things. So. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, but who's our pioneer of the day today? Uh, you know, our pioneer day is only fitting um, with, if we if we use Ghana, this episode as a case study, the Black Star. Black Star. For Ghana. You know, Ghana Black Stars. Do you know where the, you know, Black Star term comes from, you know? I don't. Where it, does it come from? You know, Ghana being it's 1957 gaining independence, one of the first African countries to gain independence. Mm-hmm. And 
uh, almost uh, uprising of Pan Africanism. Mm-hmm. Um, the likes of Kruma and you had Malcolm and yeah. Angel, Maya Angelou, yeah. all going there around that time. Um, interesting fact: it traces back the Black Star to um, who was the first. Uh, who this is a little quiz? Who was the first uh, advocator of Pan Africanism? Uh, that would have to be Marcus Garvey. That's right, yeah. um, Marcus Garvey, in the twenties, in the diaspora, the diaspora, right? yeah, um, started a whole movement um, called the Back to Africa movement. Yes, though? Back to Africa, and advocating yeah. for you know black people in the diaspora and uprooted from Africa through slavery to return back to the continent, return back home. Mm-hmm. And um, he started a movement of Pan Africanism, and he had a shipping company called uh, Black Line. I think it was the, it yeah, the Black Star, Black Star Line, Line. The Black Star Line mm-hmm. to help blacks to help black people return t- back to Africa. Imagine that. So imagine that this guy did this in like you know uh, over a hundred years ago. He had this yeah. vision. Yeah. And get, you know, uh, 30, 40 years later, when Ghana gained independence, mm-hmm. you know, and they became known as the Black Stars. So, you know, it stems from the Garvey Black Star Line movement of, you know, providing shipping opportunities for black people back to the continent. So it's mad, bro. you know, it's it's only it's a very interesting piece of history. And for that reason, Marcus Garvey is a pioneer of the day. And this is a guy who is well traveled, too. Right? Yes. He, born in Jamaica. Yep. Traveled throughout the U.S., mm-hmm. uh, Europe, London kind of lived around there africa yeah. and he definitely saw that as the the place where we needed to to settle and it's only right we continue to have this mindset because mm-hmm. people don't you know as what's interesting of us talking about it it's the same thing more or less that he was saying right mm-hmm. look at what's going in africa investments you mm-hmm. know um that's where we're from, and this is where our future should be. Uh-huh. So, um, Gavi preached that, and you know, all these great civil rights leaders or African leaders that we had, you know, they all, you know, took took a little bit of that Gavi movement. And so, when you see Doctor Umar spitting game, or Umar's tap blueprint, ask Doctor Umar where he gets that tap in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, Marcus Gavi. Um, yeah. All right, that sounds Spine good. Thank you for that. Episode, Shout yeah. out to the late great Marcus Garvey. Um, what, what what did he call his? What did they, his their followers call themselves? Garveyites, right? Uh, Is it Garveyites. I, I think. think. Oh, that, I I don't that mm-hmm. one. I don't know. Maybe we'll see what Doctor Doctor Umar probably knows. <laughs> send him an email. Send him an email. He's got the uh, FDMG Academy coming up. Donations. Uh, donations. <laughs> Have you made your donations? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> like, yeah, you're gonna make your donations. Eh? I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to email Uber. I'll be like, this yeah. brother right here, you know, <laughs> put blonde hair on his head, but don't make donations. <laughs> Yo, I hope you don't see this, man, Doctor Umar. I apologize. Hey, shout for out to hair. Umar, man. We're real shit. Shout out to him, man. Yeah, yeah. He understands the problem, though. And he does the need very well. His solutions yeah. might not be the best, but yeah. he understands the problem identification yeah. part. He does a good job of identifying. His delivery might be off, but he definitely he understands. knows the problem. He definitely yeah. understands. Yeah. But yeah, man, that's been it for episode nine. Thank you guys for tuning in once again. Yeah. Thank you guys for the continued support. Of course, and you know we're gonna try to keep staying. Uh, consistent with it but yeah. it's been episode nine do the um, like comment and yeah, uh, subscribe you know all, support us in any way that you can yeah. you know because we appreciate the support and the messages 100 percent. you don't take it for granted no sir no sir but yeah thank you guys and uh we'll catch you guys on next episode 10 all right last one let's go cheers <laughs>